Next, we're going to talk about sexually transmitted diseases and what Mama didn't tell us. I don't think I see anybody from my ethics seminar class here. Anybody here from the ethics seminar class? I don't see a single one of them. Hear me, ambitious soul. Sex is a curse of life. When I was a medical student, uh, we had only five sexually transmitted diseases, which were then known as the venereal diseases. And now we've got all these diseases, which uh, we used to have a, a bad joke. What do you give the girl who has everything? And the answer was penicillin. And... Uh, <laughs> Now the answer is a lot more complicated. <laughs> so you can see. We start off talking about genital ulcers. Here is Melissa. So we have one person from my little ethics seminar. Welcome to class, Melissa. <laughs> Hope you stayed up late studying that pathology, right? Herpes simplex, the most common cause STD in young adults in the United States. You already knew that. Treponema pallidum is uncommon in most populations, but think about it. Chancroid, LGV, granuloma inguinale, you're seldom going to see. These are the ones that we classically learned about. You're seldom going to see. And these are some of the, the uh, subtitle of this lecture is Dirty Pictures. This is a chancre of primary syphilis. It is a uh, hard chancre, the, uh, which is, uh, uh, has a cartilaginous feel to it, and uh, it is uh, painless. And that's the opposite of uh, chancroid, which is a soft chancre, which is painful. General herpes has group vesicles. When you see anything with little group vesicles or group ulcerations, think herpes. Lymphogranuloma venereum, the, uh, the main thing to think about there, the inguinal lymph nodes. And the inguinal lymph nodes in LGV tend to be classically enlarged on both sides of the inguinal ligament, causing the groove sign. That is, you've got these large lymph nodes kind of bulging out where the inguinal ligament comes in. You'll have this groove side, which I think you can kind of sell there. And this is associated with a little tiny ulcer that you can easily miss on the genitalia. Granuloma inguinale, this large, ugly-looking uh, ulcer. So what's your diagnosis here? What is that? Right, that is herpes, herpes 101. Grouped vesicles, herpes. And these are the herpes viruses by just way of review. And they keep being added. And you remember from your virus lecture that herpes 1 and herpes 2 can both go the other way, right? But the genital herpes is usually herpes 2. <clears throat> but herpes 1 can sometimes do that. Then you go on down with herpes 8 causing Kaposi sarcoma, the new fact. These are RNA or DNA viruses? DNA. DNA, right. And DNA viruses in general tend to stay in your body in contrast to RNA viruses, right? So they're worse. Genital herpes, 90% 2, 10% 1, 400,000 episodes primary episodes and 20 million recurrences in, in this country per year, which is why drugs for herpes have a fairly big market play. 20% of the U.S. population between 15 and 40 have antibodies without any history. So herpes is, is common. Recurrent herpes, pain, psychological distress. I've been, some people have come to me with the idea that marriage is going to break up if I call this herpes.
It's one of the torch agents, remember? Because uh, disease, severe disease to newborn infants, and the ulcers might facilitate HIV transmission. So what's your diagnosis here? Herpes. Herpes. These ragged, when you see a bunch of ragged ulcers like this, you know, think herpes. Syphilis wasn't a, a bad guess, but you see really four there at least. One, two, three, four. See, oftentimes you see not the blisters, but ragged ulcers. You may see these around the rectum. We'll show some pictures of that. This is uh, primary herpes on the vulva. Again, these ragged uh, ulcerations. That looks painful, doesn't it? The cervix around the rectum, an HIV positive patient and, and AIDS patients, uh, herpes can just be really bad because these terrible ulcerations. So again, you just see something that looks yucky with, uh, don't put that in the chart though. <laughs> Numerous ulcers, irregular looking, ragged, and you want to say, um, thank goodness it's you, not me, right? <laughs> Think herpes. And this slide gives the explanation for that bad uh, aphorism, of, a joke of what's the difference between love and herpes. Remember that one? Right, herpes is forever. And, uh, and this shows why. That by the time you know you have herpes, the virus has made a round trip and has set up shop in your nerve ganglion, right? Inoculated here, it goes down the nerve, sets up shop in the ganglion where it replicates, then migrates back toward the inoculation site where it causes disease. So once you've got the disease, it's already replicated there. And so, absent a technology to eradicate the organism from the ganglion, herpes uh, is forever. And this is why recurrences come out right when it goes back. And the recurrences tend to be milder or more severe than the initial attack. They tend to be milder. The diagnosis, grouped vesicles, pustules, and ulcers. Laboratory is quite sensitive in the vesicular pustular stage. Serology really has a fairly limited clinical value. It's a fairly easy virus to culture or demonstrate. General herpes, last two to three weeks. Systemic manifestations can occur. And why would it cause urinary and fecal retention? Excuse me? It hurts to go to the bathroom to be, to, to, uh, to be sure. Right, Karen? It gets it because it gets into sacral nerve plexus. So it messes up your nerves. Recurrent herpes, milder. Fewer episodes, last only a few days, and may be asymptomatic or hyposymptomatic. And this, of course, is one reason why the disease keeps going on and why you have to be careful whom you have sex with. That's a laugh over there. Okay. All right. All who are monogamous here, raise your hand. Uh, it's <laughs> Herpes labialis. You see, and it's amazing, you'll see groups of vesicles, and you begin to catch on. I mean, I saw a guy that uh, he had groups of vesicles on his ear, for example, and diagnosed him as having herpes. Seen it on, on the lid, this, this picture of little group vesicles, think herpes. Little group vesicles think herpes. So that would be when it appears on the skin, 
It's sometimes called herpes gladiatorum, meaning in close physical contact, or gladiatorum in wrestlers, herpes. This was a guy that I saw who had fluid herpes in the mouth. You look at something like that, say, my goodness, what is it? Focus on the unit lesion, a little vesicle that's ruptured. Culture me had herpes. Do you think this hurt? Great goodness, yes. Hurt. What is this lesion? Herpes. Good guess. <clears throat> Carrie knew that right away, right? That's herpes Whitlow. That's an occupational hazard of who? Doctors and nurses, right. Herpes Whitlow. And you don't want to cut into it because it will rapidly spread. So you need to recognize that and not IND it. Any questions about herpes? What's your diagnosis here? Good guess. Syphilis. Syphilis. Shanker. Syphilis. One point about syphilis, of course, which may be by way of review, is a serology. And the screening serology, the VDRL or RPR, the reagenic tests, are, uh, are of diagnostic value with high positive or and negative predictive value, mainly in the secondary phase, which is really virtually 100% positive in secondary syphilis. A lot of the manifestations of which you do to analyze. In the other stages of syphilis, the RPR, the serology is useful, but does not have 100% sensitivity. And so why not go ahead and go straight to the specific treponemal tests? Well, one reason not to do that and not to use them as screening tests goes back to Bayes' theorem that we went over in one of the first lectures and you might remember, and that was you go from the prevalence of the disease to the likelihood that a positive test is false positive. Remember that the relationship is not defined by a straight line, but rather by this parabolic curve, so that when the pretest probability becomes very low, even with a very good test, such as FTA or ABS, you're likely to get a false positive result. Clinically, I tend to see that when people start using the FTA ABS as a screen for people who have an eye lesion uh, or something that, or an ear lesion or deafness that might be syphilis, but they're not sure. So we clearly need better tests to pick up those people. So those are some of the serologies. And some current perspectives uh, on syphilis, uh, HIV epidemic, people don't respond as well to treatment. Syphilis now in this country is mainly of African Americans especially, and we're seeing a resurgence of congenital syphilis, which is bad. So the stages of syphilis, which is, should be by way of review, primary is the chancre. Secondary is marked by spirochetemia and immune complexes. And that's important because, uh, to know about because <clears throat> the rashes and especially things like glomerulonephritis, which sometimes occur, occurs, can be due to immune complexes. Latent, positive serology without manifestations. And then tertiary, mainly the nervous system and the aorta. <clears throat> it used to be said that if you knew syphilis and TB, you knew all of medicine because of the protein manifestations of syphilis. Syphilology is a disease that has become uncommon has uh, sort of been neglected. This slide, which is in your handout, simply shows this in terms of uh, the uh, course of syphilis. And the most common call, uh, syndrome of syphilis that you're going to probably see is going to be people with a positive serological test, late, late in syphilis. And this is a pretty good breakdown. Maybe a third of them might go on to tertiary syphilis. A third will have a positive serology without symptoms, and a third will have a negative RPR but a positive FTA ABS, and they will be asymptomatic as well. 
to the course of it. Here's syphilis. Uh, in, in women, of course, syphilis uh, is a lot more subtle and, and difficult to diagnose, mainly because the primary lesion, painless as it is, is less apt to be recognized. There's a shaker in a fairly embarrassing location. Secondary syphilis, uh, think secondary syphilis whenever you see a diffuse macular rash. And it's sort of axiomatic in, in dermatology, but for all of us as well, that when we have an undiagnosed rash that might be psoriasis, might be pityriasis rosea, uh, to uh, get a serology for syphilis. Secondary syphilis notoriously involves the palms and soles here and here very dramatically. Not always, so that's the point. <clears throat> what condition is this? Excuse me? Good, good thought. It's actually not. It's, uh, it's pityriasis rosea, which is a skin lesion that's seasonal, thought to be brought around by birds. But uh, you get all these lesions, and it tends to be a single herald plaque. A lesion that comes out earlier, that's the herald plaque right there. But the point is, that in, in this condition, you, don't, you should always test for uh, secondary syphilis. Uh, these are some manifestations of syphilis, secondary syphilis from the trunk, for example, on the soles of the foot, split papules, so-called, and then there's a skin lesion, secondary syphilis, a, a, a warty-like lesion, condyloma latum, so-called. What does latum mean from the Latin? Be flat. A little wart that tends to be flat top, like a mesa, perhaps, as opposed to condyloma acuminata from Popova viruses, which are more, much more irregular, uh, verrucous-looking. Congenital syphilis with the big liver, big spleen, rash, torch agent, high mortality. What's this lesion? Congenital syphilis. This is Hutchinson's teeth. Hutchinson's teeth, short, notched, widely spaced, barrel-shaped central incisors. Hutchinson's teeth. Secondary, I'm tertiary, uh, congenital, I'm sorry, congenital syphilis. Another one is a mulberry molar. I've seen Hutchinson's teeth. Actually, one, one patient, I had them bring in a picture. They'd lost their teeth, but I had them bring in a picture of what their teeth looked like, and, they, uh, and it showed me a big toothy smile, and lo and behold, there were Hutchinson's teeth. The serologies for syphilis, the RPR and VDRL, can be false positive. Anything that will cause you to make antibodies in a nonspecific way can cause the serology to be false positive. Numerous infections will do it, connective tissue diseases, other things that cause uh, just a generalized polyclonal B lymphocyte response will cause BFP reactions. Any questions about syphilis? Syphilis. What's your diagnosis here? Chancroid, right. A typical location. Chancroid is a the opposite of syphilis. It's a soft, painful chancre. Chancroid is, is rare, but you do see it. It's caused by a bacterium, Haemophilus decreyi. Appears on the prepus and frenulum of men, labia and vestibule in women. And that would be a typical location on the frenulum. And that's the organism, the schools of fish appearance on a gram stain. That's it for chancroid. Chancroid is a 
rare disease in this country, um, but it does happen. Remember, you've seen it. Chancroid, schools of fish, Amophilus decrei, soft, painful chancre, chancroid. What's your diagnosis here? Another classic venereal disease. <clears throat> Let's focus on that, maybe. Let's say LGV. Going back to the groove sign that we looked at earlier. And this is a chlamydia trachomonis of three different serovars. <clears throat> chlamydia trachomonis. Painless vesicle papular ulcer, easily overlooked. Inguinal adenopathy, groove sign. Later on, this can cause fibrosis and obstruction. So LGV, chlamydia trachomonis, unimpressive primary lesion, <clears throat> big inguinal lymphadenopathy, <clears throat> groove sign, late fibrosis. That's what you need to know about LGV. Another, what? Oh, did you miss it when I showed it? Yeah, it was just, uh, I'm not sure how well it transmitted here, but it would be in this picture there. Yeah, and what, it, what it is, again, is just having the big uh, inguinal lymph nodes that sort of pull in. you got in, the inguinal ligament there, right? So it causes the skin to sort of groove in there on either side of the two parts ligament. Who wants to offer a diagnosis there? Well, we've had chancroid and granuloma uh, inguinale, so, uh, excuse me? We have, we've had chancroid and, and, and LGV, so what's left? Granuloma inguinale. That's a big, beefy, red, velvety ulcer. It's got, the organism's got now an, an unpronounceable and unspellable name. Gene, you know how to pronounce that? I've never heard anybody pronounce it. Yeah. Calamatobacterium granulomatous. All right. <laughs> I've never seen a case of this. The thing to remember there is the Donovan body. Small, painless papillonodule involved in a beefy red exuberant, heaped up looking ulcer, Donovan bodies, bipolar looking safety spin, safety pins. Any questions there? It's a rare disease. Now we go to a much more common disease. What's your diagnosis here? Excuse me? What did you say? He said gynecoccus, right. We see here, we see... Uh, Biscuit shape, are they gram negative or gram positive? Positive? <laughs> are they red or blue? Are they red or purple? They look red to me. Int interestingly, when you look at uh, a gram stain of a, a drip in, in gonorrhea, and you look at the polys, it tends to be an all or none phenomena. Either the polys have no bacteria in the cytoplasm or they've just opened the gates, floodgates. But you see just about every conceivable phagocytic vacuole in this particular poly is filled with these gram negative biscuit shaped uh, or stacked donuts diplococci. So that's CLAP, right? That's CLAP. And CLAP is. Uh, a dramatic and fairly easily diagnosable disease in men, but not in women. And uh, my lament about the STDs in general is that uh, they're more apparent in men and have worse consequences in women. I think women get a very unfair break when it comes to STDs. Acute anterior urethritis in men, easily diagnosed in the gram stain. Endocervicitis in women, easily missed, consequences can be tragic. Rectal, symptoms nonspecific, pharyngitis, difficult to treat. 
Uh, Gonococcus is a fastidious gram-negative rod, as you know. Uh, modified culture media are used that have antibiotics that uh, knock out other competing organisms. The, 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 the biology of gonococci is uh, fairly interesting. Like E. coli and others, they're pili that uh, facilitate attachment, lipopolysaccharides, have cytopathic effect, IgA proteases, so they're well equipped to do all this damage. And other things have been looked at in recent years, and this is just a model that one of my mentors, Dr. Zell McGee, worked out about how the gonococcus uh, when it infects the fallopian tube, because this is a tragic, one of the tragic things that happens is it infects the fallopian tube, called predisposed not only to PID, but also to sterility, and can be a route to systemic infection. So the men, again, have this drip. This, they got the clap. You go get treated. Women show up with uh, gonorrhea of the fallopian tube with tragic consequences, have oophorectomies, et cetera, et cetera. The idea that Zell McGee worked out is that the gonococcus attaches to non-ciliated epithelial cells. is then endocytosed. As it goes into the cell, it knocks off the, the cilia of the nearby cells. So now it's going in this way, the cilia are knocked off here, uh, and, and then it's, it goes all the way through and is released on the other side, so you get chemotactic stimulation with pus forming here, and you also get, having lost your, uh, the uh, fallopian tube equivalent of the mucociliary blanket that we talked about in the respiratory lecture, uh, you've paved the way for organisms such as anaerobes and E. coli and enterococci that normally would just be propelled on down toward the uterus by the cilia to get in secondary invaders. So that when you go in, in a good case of, uh, of pelvic inflammatory disease, a, a tubo variant abscess, whatever, uh, you'll find five, six, seven different species of bacteria, and you'll find lots of uh, crazy bacteroides species, et cetera, peptostreptococci, and so on and so forth. Epidemiology. Maybe declining now, peaked at about 1 in 200 people in 1975. Female to male transmission, 20% per episode. Male to female transmission, less well studied, but about 50% per contact, rising to over 90%. So, yes, ma'am. Why it's called the clap? I'm going to go and, and look that up for you. I'm not quite sure. I, I should know that. Why is it called the clap? I know, you know Boswell's Life of Johnson? A guy wrote an article titled Boswell's Clap. A lot of people have had it over the years. I don't know, but I don't know why it's called the clap. Good question. Why is it called the clap? Let's see if we can find that out. Pathology of gonorrhea. It was long, it's in storied history of it, and for a long time there was a great debate about whether uh, gonorrhea and syphilis were the same disease. And uh, the great John Hunter, great 18th century surgeon who made surgeons gentlemen, and so it said, uh, decided to do the experiment on himself, so he took discharge from someone with gonorrhea and injected it himself. Unfortunately, the guy also had syphilis, the patient did. And it's said that he died of uh, aortic regurgitation. And uh, that's what got him from syphilis. So it infects this next slide, so I, I, just to show you what I've talked about. Attaches to pili, penetrates, vigorous polymorph nuclear leukocyte response, pus. That's uh, probably maybe the dirtiest picture that I'm showing today. <laughs> That's clap. Acute anterior urethritis in men, usually a, uh, a florid discharge. Sometimes a discharge can be scant, and, and occasionally men are asymptomatic. The key point about gonorrhea uh, it, and all these STDs is always think about co-infection with uh, chlamydia. Think about cl co-infection with chlamydia. 
In women, this would be at cervicitis. It's a lot more subtle. I'm not sure from that picture I could diagnose anything, are you? But it's said to show gonorrhea. Mainly the endocervical canal, increased discharge, dysuria, bleeding, menorrhagia, up to 90% asymptomatic. Signs are subtle, and this, of course, is the basis for routine screening in women. Abdominal or pelvic pain usually indicates salpingitis. And this is the basis for the chandelier sign. You do a pelvic and palpate that next area, they reach up for the chandelier. It hurts so bad. Co-infection with other organisms is very common. So women get the worst of it. Anorectal gonorrhea, surprisingly common. It's summarized there. Any questions there? Acute proctitis, et cetera, et cetera. Infection with chlamydia can cause similar findings. The acute proctitis. Anasmus, purulent discharge, rectal bleeding in men. Pharyngitis occurs as well. It doesn't tend to be as painful as, uh, say, strep pharyngitis, but it's hard to eradicate. Positive throat cultures, 10 to 25% of gay men, 10 to 20% of women with gonorrhea, most asymptomatic, can cause symptomatic pharyngitis, gonorrhea. In women, gonorrhea can also get out the fimbriated end of the fallopian tube and can ascend and get into the bloodstream. Pelvic inflammatory disease, PID, usually gonorrhea, can be uh, other things including chlamydia, various combinations of endometritis, salpingitis, tubo ovarian abscess. PID is sort of an umbrella term. Infertility, 15 to 20 percent after one episode, 50 to 80 percent after three or more episodes. That's important. Yes. Right, right. One, one infection. A lot of people are going to be infected repeatedly. Lower abdominal pain. Two thirds have fever, leukocytosis, elevated sed rate. Again, chlamydia can cause it. Gonococcal tends to be more overt and florid. What would be the likely clinical scenario for this patient? This is the uh, gonococcal arthritis dermatitis syndrome. And you may get to see that. I, I see this from time to time. The next few slides I've I took myself. This would be somebody who might not have had symptomatic gonorrhea, but shows up with this uh, hemorrhagic uh, vesicular pustular lesion, which is now ruptured with surrounding what looks like cellulitis. And she's got arthritis or tenosynovitis. Her joints hurt in an asymmetric way. And this is the gonorrhea, gonococcal arthritis dermatitis syndrome. These are some other pictures of it disseminated gonococcal infection. So in a sexually active young person, you see lesions like this and the joints hurt. That is a syndrome of gonorrhea. Early macules, hemorrhagic pustule, hemorrhagic lesion, single lesion here. So it's a skin lesion, hemorrhagic vesicular pustule. This is uncommon. Some patients will have just arthritis of one joint, usually the knee. Others will have this tenosynovitis, which means there's not so much swelling, but particularly it would hurt to move, say, the wrist in that direction. So these folks are sick. Uncommonly with gonorrhea, you can get endocarditis, meningitis, perihepatitis, known as the Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome, rarely other things. So disseminated gonococcal infection does occur uncommonly, and the most common one that we see now 
is this arthritis dermatitis syndrome. And notice that for diagnosis of gonorrhea, doing a gram stain of the urethra for CLAP has got a pretty good sensitivity and specificity. But as you go down to women, sensitivity of a gram stain is very low. And this is why we would use an ELISA-based uh, method for screening nowadays for women. Any questions about gonorrhea? We're going to look up CLAP, see if we can find the answer to that. <laughs> yeah? Have you, have you already Googled CLAP? Margaret Clapp, she was an 18th century keeper of a, of a brothel, and you got that on Google? Yeah, <laughs> yeah for, for extra credit, who knows where the word crap came from? <laughs> crap came from the guy who, who popularized the toilet. I'm not sure he had the flush toilet in England. His name was Thomas Crapper. <laughs> and so when American GIs went over, you know, it said, it said Crapper in all the toilets instead of Crane, you know, or Kohler. And so they would call it the Crapper, <laughs> you know, and so where that came from. Somebody wrote a biography of him that was called Flush with Pride, the biography of Thomas Crapper. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody had a question over here. I thought you did you talk about Fitz Hugh Curtis syndrome? I did. Okay. Is it something that is associated with both gonorrhea and chlamydia? It can be, but it's usually a gonorrhea, but chlamydia can cause it. I, I incline to be skeptical of that, but that's what the books say that chlamydia can cause it. But the Fitz Hugh Curtis syndrome is where you get an ascending gonococcal infection that gets around the liver. And it causes something that anatomically has been said to be violin string adhesions between the liver and the diaphragm around the liver. And it can clinically mimic acute cholecystitis with right upper quadrant abdominal pain, Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome. Right, so you might, that'll serve you well in differential diagnosis and rounds and that sort of thing. Fits you, F I T Z H U G H, capital H U G H. An old Virginia name, I believe, like Curtis. I guess they were broken down after the war and had to become doctors. What's your diagnosis here? That would be uh, chlamydia. Very common, now the most common STD. High rates in adolescents, African Americans. And this is just the life cycle chlamydia. For, remember, is it an elementary body gets in the host cell, multiplies, forms new infectious elementary bodies that are extruded from the cell. The large inclusion body results, which would be shown on the previous slide. And here we make the point that uh, chlamydia can seem to do most of the things that gonorrhea can do. Perihepatitis would be this Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome that we just talked about. Usually these are milder, but the point is to think chlamydia, and when you treat gonorrhea, to always co-treat for chlamydia. It affects the same mucosal sites as gonorrhea and cause the same things. Asymptomatic infections during pregnancy can cause neonatal conjunctivitis and pneumonia. 
and we generally use uh, antigen detection systems for uh, diagnosis. DNA tests can also be used. They tend to be very sensitive and specific. And chlamydia is uh, a lot more common in, say, upper socioeconomic groups, of course, than gonorrhea is, and tends to be uh, asymptomatic or hyposymptomatic. Only one out of eight infected men followed without treatment develop symptoms. However, it causes about 30 to 50 percent of symptomatic non-gynecocal urethritis, an even higher proportion of post-gynecocal urethritis, indicating again that lots of folks are co-infected. The incidence is significantly higher than gynecocal urethritis. The discharge, less impressive, white, gray, sometimes clear. Gram stain shows a few white cells, typically. You can get epididymitis. You can get reactive arthritis, which we talked about, including something called Reiter syndrome. Transmission to women can occur. And in women, acute urethral syndrome, one of the causes, and cervicitis as well. It's been suggested that this is so common that we ought to put the antibiotic azithromycin in the drinking water on college campuses. Cause about half the cases of PID in this country every year. A big cause of ectopic pregnancy. Again, the risk to neonates. What's your diagnosis here? Yeah, that'd be condyloma acuminata. The POVA viruses, we're just going to cover some of the little a few other stuff, that would be scabies, pubic lice. That's the end of the slideshow.